My name is Brandon Gross, and I am the student president of the In The Zone Club, and I would welcome, like to welcome you to our Bridegroom event. Bridegroom is the story of Shane Bittany Crone and his late partner, Tom Bridegroom. It is now my great pleasure to introduce Shane Bittany Crone. Yeah, you mentioned this um, in the documentary. You said, God wouldn't set us up to constantly fight the urge of what we are. So you think that in some way, um, I mean, along with other things that were in your life too, but being with him um, helped you to get to that point of recognizing not fighting yourself? Yeah, I mean, I, I've kind of now reached a place where I feel like we all like, have our own relationship with God. And you know, I just personally would like to believe that, that God loves everyone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you know, just knowing like who I am and that I've you know, been gay ever since I can remember. Sure. I just, I feel like why would you know, he or, or whatever like intentionally put you on this earth and just have to go through all of that and suffer and have people judge you, you know, your entire life. I just don't think that, that that's, um, you know, what he would want, so. Yeah. Yeah. And your relationship helped you to see that because when you were falling in love, um, you were able to, it seems like, just to kind of be in the moment and get to embrace your good qualities and his good qualities and make this, uh, and co-create this existence that um, is helping to do the things that you just described. Yeah, I think like falling in love, it's, you know, as most of us have fallen in love often more than once, I think that yeah. it's, it can be very empowering mm -hmm. and it kind of can just allow you to, you know, not care so much what people think and it's just yeah. like an exciting time. Um, I think like, you know, like the honeymoon phase or whatever, um, going from that point to then just kind of just getting more to like the routine of our relationship that some of those like insecure thoughts start coming back mm. and just kind of becoming more reserved, especially being gay and even in LA, I just like so many reservations about just even like holding hands in public or something like that was just not even an option in my yeah. head. Even though I'm like, okay, I, I'm in love with this person, I still was just like too scared to, you know, be open with that. Yeah, it wasn't until France where you finally said, okay, I can, I, I can do a little, little kiss. And you said, I'm just gonna <laughs> just, just do it well, and go with it. My partner Tom and I, we, yeah, we went to Paris um, and we were standing outside the, the Eiffel Tower and, mm -hmm. you know, you just you see all of these couples out there that are all kissing and there's people are taking photos of them and it's just like a common thing. I mean, you're in Paris. And so, for whatever reason, that was like, like the first time that I'm like, you know what, I don't care yeah. what people think. Well, I mean, when I kissed him, I immediately like looked around and I was like, yeah. did anyone see that? So, I, right. mean, I guess I cared a little bit. but. Um, I mean, yeah, that felt good. I mean, I mean, it's just unfortunate that doing something kind of so simple for you know, straight couples is, um, it's just that it's so challenging for LGBT people. Right, it, it's, it's magnified. Um, and we have some footage, you know, of you in that first stage that you're talking about, falling in love and, and all the things that are good. So uh, Brandon, if you can help to show this, and I think he might be out there talking, but once he comes in, he'll be able to show us <laughs> some like of the, the video clip on that. Um, but when you were falling in love, though, you were, um, I mean, like it is probably for most people, I mean, it's euphoric, and you get your chance to, um, I guess, lose yourself a little bit in, in that person. Well, I mean, like growing up in Montana, has, have any of you been to Montana before? Oh, you have? Oh, awesome, yay. Um, yeah, I, I just think, I mean, most of my life up until I was 18, I moved away. All I dreamt about was falling in love. It's kind of like the one thing that kept me going. Uh -huh. And so for me to finally like meet someone and to experience that, I mean, not that you can necessarily describe love, but um, right. just those feelings. It happens to you. Yeah, just, you know? just like this out of body experience. And it just made me so grateful that I push through those years and that I was able to, you know, stick around to experience that. Good. And all day together. And then he would go home, which would lead to later in the evening talking on the phone for a few hours. 
it did not take long for me to really feel comfortable with Tom that I could tell him anything. Like, I trusted him with my life. Tom was a very confident person. <laughs> he ran after Shane. <laughs> my first Shane was like, ah, because he had never been in a relationship before. He, but this was his first, you know, his first love. We went to hear Tom one time, and Shane would look around the room while he was playing because he wanted to make sure Everyone everybody was paying, was paying attention and seeing what he saw. And there's a, a Jewish word called kvel, and that's what he looked like when Tom performed. He was gvelling, he was glowing. It was incredible to finally experience that feeling of love. You, you know, like the butterflies, it's what I'd always imagined that all my friends felt like. It didn't take long for me to move into his apartment. They got very close very quickly. I think their freedom wasn't moving to LA. I think Tom was definitely the door for Shane to come to terms with himself. Tom was a safe place. When Tom met Shane, he was a little lost sheep. And Tom really looked out for Shane. He loved making dinner, even when he was really tired. He loved tying my ties, even properly tucking my shirt in, because at Culver, they teach you how to do all that. Tom truly was pursuing his dreams, and Shane knew that bills had to be paid. Shane was the level-headed one. What one couldn't think of, the other one could. They found an awful lot in common. They were both romantics. They're both from small towns. Both wanted to make a impression on the world. They were always smiling and always having a good time. And they're the kind of couple that makes you believe in love. I just, I loved their bickering, which was really flirting. That was probably my favorite part of their relationship. I did this once in military school. The kid had to shave his head. Oh, why are you telling me? Seriously, don't press so hard. They were like an old married couple. They were young, gay, but they never wanted to go out. Like, let's go to the bar, let's go to club. They didn't go out a lot because they were always working, trying to build something. I know that for Tom, it wasn't just about fidelity, which, of course, was like number one. It was also about being completely emotionally available, uh, mentally available, spiritually available to Shane. When you get to my age, you start being a little agnostic that anything like that can occur. But over time, it became pretty apparent that this was something that was probably going to last for a very, very long time. There was an aura about them that just was something special. Everyone in this room or anyone watching this documentary could wish that they had the love that Tom and Shane had. That's what you dream about at night. And they had it. We saw that, so any other, did that remind you of any other dynamics or other right, things you went through? Well, I've never been like on a stage where like the film's like playing right there, so that's kind of like an interesting Is this surreal? Experience. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, yeah, I mean, it's just, like I don't watch the film anymore because I usually, I screen the documentary about like two or three times a week. Mm. And so, um, yeah, this is the first time in a while that I've seen that and, um, I guess when I watch it now, it just it just makes me grateful, like more than anything, that yeah. that I was able to experience that. Because, mm -hmm. um, and I don't think that I mean I've met a lot of people who said that they haven't ever like fallen in love before, so it just makes me yeah really appreciate that. Yeah, and hopeful for those of us who have not, if you. You haven't yet, so it's, that's it's possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're you're proof of that. Um, I'm wondering if so. We see that, and it's like you get to the good part. You get to the the good stuff. You know, to be with someone that you want to be with, and you just connect on all of these levels. Um, how does that experience? What does that? Does it validate your coming out? process that you went through in some way I'm, I'm wondering what that looks like yeah totally I mean I kind of had the mindset that there's no need for me to come out to my family until there was like a reason to exactly I wasn't just gonna be like hey I'm gay um, yeah it was so I felt like with Tom and like falling in love I'm like okay now this kind of makes sense because it's like me saying 
this is someone that I'm in love with and I want to spend the rest of my life with. Mm -hmm. And I think it also gave me more power. I felt more confident um, knowing that I had his support. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, that definitely gave me courage to, to eventually come out. That's awesome. Yeah, Dakota Fanning has expressed something similar where, you know, she says, yeah, I don't see the need uh, in talking about uh, to my folks, you know, who I'm, I'm with unless I'm bringing someone home because I feel like this will be my life partner. So, so there's a, uh, you know, there's a lot of fun and frolic in it as we saw, but there's a, 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 a seriousness as well too, that, that commitment. Um, what was it too, like yeah. when we were first in a relationship, I hid it from my family. And so, although it was like an exciting time. For, for how long did you have I mean, it? it was, like almost like a, I want to say a year that, you know, that was always interesting, like being That's in the a car, long time. like on speakerphone with like with my mom. Yeah. I'm like, oh, you know, I'm just here with my buddy Tom going to the grocery store. <laughs> <laughs> makes total sense. Um, or even when we yeah, decided to move in together and my mom would come visit, you know, we made sure we had like both of the bedrooms like set like, yeah. you know, so it looks like. Sure. You know. And that's a lot of work to go through. So, I mean, throughout that year, your thought process, was it, I guess, to compartmentalize like, okay, here's what it is when I'm with him. But then when I'm speaking to my family, it's got to be this way. Were, were you working your way up uh, to telling them or did you still want to see how the relationship developed before you felt like you needed to. I kind to of told out. myself that I would know when it felt right. Mm. And when my mom came to, to LA, that mm -hmm. was the, one of the trips. I just kind of felt like, okay, this is the, the moment that I need to do it. Yeah. yeah. And you were nervous. Oh yeah. I mean, I don't know, if we, I don't know if we show that. Um, well, I mean, yeah, I was terrified because even though like, you know that your mom loves you, it's still just like that, you know, the thoughts in the back of your head, you're like, what happens if this like just makes her angry yeah. and she's just upset with me and right. um, so you just see, yeah, I mean, you don't know. Because um, I've heard from so many people that they're so afraid to come out to the parents and then they, you know, the parents don't even react at all and they're just like, we love you, we support you. Yeah. And then there's other people who thought that their parents would be just very open and accepting and then they come out and their parents are like furious. So you just, sure. you just never, you know. Yeah, sometimes it's anticlimactic in other mm -hmm. ways. Uh, other times, you know, it's, it's, it's a big deal. So we'll see what it is for you. So let's, let's look at that, the, uh, the coming out process. The more Tom and I fell in love, the more we wanted to tell our parents about it. But each of us had the philosophy that there was no need to tell your family until you found that person that you were gonna spend the rest of your life with. So my mom and my aunt were visiting and it was very late at night but I, I told my mom that I had to talk to her. With Tom by my side, I said, Mom? I said, honey, if you're gonna tell me you're gay, that's fine, I know it, and I'm with, okay with it. And I said, and is Tom your partner? And Tom goes, yep, I'm his partner. Tom was sitting there waiting for a big blow up or something, and I just said, well, great. I, you know, I don't have to worry about Shane like I did. Tom was my godsend. Shane didn't have his anxieties anymore. He was um, more confident, he was happy. He was just more of a man. I never imagined that I could love my mom even more than I did. She'd been there through all my struggles of being gay and we never said out loud what the real deal was, but now we had. It was the greatest feeling ever. Just not roasting on an open fire. Tom and I knew it would be a challenge to come out to his parents. So he was in Indiana for Christmas. It was just him and his mom, and there was something that came on TV about a lesbian couple. And Tom's mom made a comment about how that was disgusting. And Tom, at that moment, just realized, like, I need to tell her. He told his mom, Mom, I'm gay. Like, when you say things like that, you're talking about me. He was, I think, sort of building on what had happened when Shane came out. Shane had come out to his mother and she basically filled in the blanks. Oh, you're gay, I knew that, I always knew that. I was sure that his mom knew that he was gay, but she immediately called his dad to, to come home from work because of this breaking news. And she went on and on about how 
it was a sin and that Tom should have told them sooner so he could have gotten medical help. His dad said a lot of hateful things towards him and and blamed Shane for making him gay. It's Shane's fault, Shane turned you gay. Um, being in LA turned you gay. All of your accomplishments so far being nothing now. They said, change your mind, you have to change your mind. And Tom said that he just kept saying no. Like, I, you know, I can't change my mind. It's not a, a mind change thing. Tom called me, he told me that his dad pulled a shotgun on him. And at that point, I, I was really scared. So while Tom and I were on the phone, his dad, Norman, literally ripped the door off the hinges. And his mom got on the phone and she said to me, listen here, fucker. Um, I don't know what you did to our son, but we're gonna come to LA, we're gonna find you. I think the phrase his dad used was, he was gonna come out to California and gut him. I used to always have this fantasy of Tom and I going to Indiana uh, for Christmas and just you know going to bed and waking up on Christmas morning, all of us going out to the living room. You know, there's the tree and Tom and I just sitting there with his family, opening presents together and me just saying something that I think's funny and I look over and Tom's parents are laughing. Um, it's stupid, but it's just, you know, just, it would be like an incredible thing if something like that happened. When the police showed up at the house, Tom's dad just kind of poo pooed it off. He said, ah, you know how these California kids are. Those phone calls for those next two days until Tom got out of there were just, I, my heart just broke for both those boys. It was, it was just so scary and so sad. So that next morning, Tom's parents were in the kitchen with the Bible on the table. Out loud, they were saying the verses almost in a way just to justify that the day before, they beat up their son because he was gay. He's like, I can't believe this. I just got attacked and told that I should have taken the fact that I'm gay to the grave. It was just an awful situation, and Tom, you know, got out of there as soon as he could and flew back to California. So it's like a tale of two cities. Yeah, I mean, I just assumed that he would have a similar experience, and I just thought that his mom would react the same way that my mom had. And, sure. Um, so I, I felt, like, awful um, when he called me and told me what was happening, because I kind of encouraged him to come out. Mm -hmm. um, because I just, yeah, I didn't, I didn't think that that would happen. I mean, I knew that his parents were conservative, and I, I knew that his dad was, I mean, extra conservative. But I just, I just didn't anticipate that. Yeah, yeah. So it was scary. Um, I just, yeah, not only did I feel guilty, but I was also just, I felt so bad for, for Tom. Um, I mean, because it was like devastating. Like these are his parents, like the ones who you think will love you um, unconditionally, and. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, with, with him too, I, I thought for sure they'd accept him because he was like the top of his class, like he was good at everything that he did. Like, Renaissance man. Yeah. yeah, I mean, like he was like the ideal son. And, um, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden, like one thing just meant that everything else was meaningless. Um, I just couldn't understand that. Yeah, I, I could imagine. Um, you know, we have what we call a safe zone training here and what we do is um, we talk about, you know, explaining this is what LGBTQ means and here are preferred pronouns if you are in the process of transitioning or however you identify or whatever it is. And the other thing is we talk about is the coming out process. And, um, and Brandon uh, shared his story at the, at the most recent Safe Zone training. And we've had, we had someone else speak to that as well. Um, one thing that hasn't come up is um, in the case of yourself, um, as it was described, is, is feeling more like a man. I, I haven't heard that, like it being so, so gendered in that way of to come out makes you feel more, yeah, in your case, like, you know, like, like a man. T talk talk well, about that, someone, your mom was saying. Yeah, I think she said that. So, yeah. um, I mean, I don't know if I necessarily felt like more of a man. I just felt like more of a, like a human, you know sure. what I mean? Just, yeah, I felt like free. Um, so yeah, that was my mom. Right. Yeah. Oh, okay. That was mom doing that. Like okay. I guess to her, I felt more of a man, but yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was gonna say because yeah, it seems like to me it would just be 
like you said, like, like you're coming more into your, your personage, right? you know, and that doesn't necessarily have to be gendered. That's, that's why I just thought right. that was interesting. Well, I mean, also find it interesting way. too that like, you know, you always hear like, come out, come out, like, you know, yeah. life will be so much better. And unfortunately, the reality is that there are still a lot of people in like small towns that they, if they come out, they could potentially be kicked out of their homes. And that happens often. Sure. And so it's, it's just not as simple as people like to make it out to be that, you know, come out and life will be great. It's, um, I mean, it's just, it's the harsh reality. And um, so I'm just, I'm glad that there's, you know, safe spaces and yeah. like the zone, like you said, um, mm -hmm. so the people have a resource. Um, Cause that's, yeah, it's not the case everywhere. So that's, yeah, it's deceptively easy. I mean, once you say it, you know, it's said and it comes out, but it's all of the ramifications before and after. And it, it makes me think of um, what President Clinton said about uh, your story, and we're seeing it. Uh, President Clinton said, this is really, on one level, a wonderful, sad, heartbreaking, but yet an exhilarating and life-affirming story. And on another level, it's a story about our nation's struggle to make one more step in forming a more perfect union for which marriage is both the symbol and substance. And so coming out would be one part relationship like you had is another part which may culminate into marriage. I'm wondering um, what your thoughts are now that marriage equality is the law of the land? I mean, there was a brief period in California when we could have gotten married. I, mean, I want to say it was like a month or something. And then, okay. um, you know, but at that time, we didn't want to just like run down to the courthouse just because this was the moment that, you know, we could do it. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, like a month later, then all of a sudden they Made it so it wasn't possible. So um, with like Prop 8 and and then you know you'd hear from people they say okay well you can be domestic partners and it gives you the same um, you know like the rights and the protections that marriage um, provides. But we didn't want to be domestic partners. We kind of just felt like it was like a second class version of marriage. Sure. You didn't want to be like hey this is my domestic partner. It just didn't feel like equal. Yeah. You know. Um, and so we, I mean, we definitely, like most people, just wanted to, to get married. We felt like that's the ultimate way to, um, you know, just show our commitment to each other and in front of our friends and our family. Um, so, yeah. That makes sense. And, you know, I'm seeing like this, this balance. I mean, even though you were, as we've seen, falling in love and having all the nice things that go along with that, at the same time, it still seems like both of you were like reflective about the process that you were going through with falling in love. You, you were deep, reflective thinkers. You didn't just run off and you know, go through a ceremony just because it was available. Um, you took a year before you, you know, told your mom about the relationship. Um, I'm wondering, how did you do that? How did you balance you know, the whirlwind of emotions that just happened to you with this um, reserve and this this logic, um, it balance it like after like coming out. Or like yeah, yeah. I'm just wondering how, how you were able to do that. Um, I mean, I honestly think just like Tom. I mean, just like being mm -hmm. with him helped me in ways that I just never ever thought possible. You know, and um, yeah. I mean, he just you know not that you want to say like well someone gives you strength. You'd like to think that you can just find that within, but I mean, he really helped me find myself and find strength that I didn't know that I had. Um, but I mean, just to make a comment too about running down the courthouse, like I don't think there's anything wrong with people that did that. Cause sure. there's a lot of people who have been fighting for marriage equality for like, you know, 20, 30 years. Exactly. So it's like, that's the moment. Um, but I think for us, we also weren't thinking of like the legal protections. It was more of like, like President Clinton was saying, like the symbolic meaning mm -hmm. of marriage. Symbol and substance. Um, yeah. And so, I mean, I wish that we would have gotten married at that time um, for just the, the legal protections alone. Mm -hmm. But I think when you're in your 20s, you're not like thinking, you know, about that. Right, um, exactly. It's just more about like the excitement of marriage. Yeah. And so he meets the family 
and you know you have the reality of that and uh any thoughts on that because we have a clip on that too so any thoughts before we um, before we get into that like is it the clip of meeting my family or like not the great grandmas or um yeah well yeah your family being oh, okay. supportive and I mean, that was a big moment, like going back to Montana and like bringing him with me, uh -huh. um, you know, to just kind of see where I grew up and to, you know, to meet the entire family, which was, it was really exciting, but also terrifying. Yeah. Um, I mean, I knew that they would like him because he's, I mean, he was like awesome, mm -hmm. but you know, still you're just insecure and you're very vulnerable. And um, I mean, I knew that people wouldn't be mean to him, but um, it, yeah, it just went a lot more smoothly than I imagined. Yeah, and you made me think, the other reason why I was asking about the whole man thing, I know that, um, you know, Tom had all these sides to him, and it's described in there. So on one hand, yeah, he, he, he could be very sensitive and could, you know, sing and, and do these artistic things, but it also said in there he could kick your ass at the same time too. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> and that's not me. <laughs> like, um, yeah. yeah, I mean, he could play sports. I, I definitely don't really know how to do that. Um, uh -huh. Me too. Yeah, so he, yeah, he was just, uh, you know, someone that could do a lot of different things. And, yeah. yeah he's a tough Multifaceted. Guy. Yeah. So let's let's see that. Let's see that clip on uh, meeting the family. So Tom and I went to Arizona to visit my grandparents. Shane was so happy. He was the happiest that I'd ever seen him since he was a little kid on up. And my great grandma Pat was there, and no one told grandma Pat that Tom and I were a couple. She was like, "Oh, nice to meet you." Um, and then later I heard her in the other room ask my grandma, Judy, like, so who was that guy? Well, I never knew Shane was gay, but I met his partner, and he was a very nice guy, and we all liked him and went along fine with it. Tom was fascinated with Grandma Pat for a few reasons. Um, you know, every year she keeps track of how many snakes she kills. Well, I'm always after a snake. I don't want him around. I mean, you killed up to how many at a, day? a spring, every spring? Oh, I killed up to 40 or better. After Tom and I went for a walk with um, both my grandmas, when we were coming back into the house, Grandma Pat like put her arm around Tom. She's like, welcome to the family. She's 90 years old, and you know she's accepting our relationship. People that talk about them, they don't understand a lot of it. And they think that if they go to church and everything, that God will take care of it. They can be just like all the rest of the guys. And so we can't get through to them. To tell you the truth, I'm tired of hearing about it. So they're not Romeo and Juliet. That's right, they're Romeo and Romeo, get over it. <laughs> <laughs> Romeo and Romeo. Yeah, that's Grandma Pat, she's awesome. Yes, she is. Um, actually, her 94, um, yeah, she turned 94 three days ago. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. And she looks so much younger than that, doesn't yeah. she? Yeah, no, I mean, yeah. up until recently, like, I mean, she was, yeah, just sharp. Um, but, um, you know, unfortunately, as you age, that kind of changes. But The inevitable. Um, yeah. I just think it's, like, it's so powerful that we have them in the film. Uh, sure. Because I didn't know if they would participate. I, I said, I completely understand if you're not comfortable with this. Um, but they wanted to. And uh, for, you know, two people that grew up in very conservative settings that, you know, relatively religious families, mm -hmm. um, I think, yeah, it sends a powerful message that, that they supported me and supported our relationship. Uh, it was funny because uh, Grandma Pat, when she did the interview, she came out of the studio, we were in Montana, and, and she was like, Shane, I do not want to be known as the snake killer. <laughs> and, and I mean, at yeah. that point, I hadn't seen the interview, so I, I'm like, yeah, don't worry about it. Like, I mean, I, I knew that she killed snakes, but... Um, right. And then it was in the film, and I'm like, oh gosh, like that's one yeah. thing people remember. Um, and how did she handle that when, when um, she saw that? So I guess she was fine with it. Okay. Um, my dad made a joke that she didn't remember doing the interview, um, but I mean, she did. Um, right. And she was also funny too, because like she refused to set her dog Snoopy down. Um, oh. Which they wanted Snoopy out of the room because he was breathing like so heavy, um, <laughs> and you can hear it. And yeah. And then Grandma Judy refused to take off her sunglasses. And one of the producers is like, why won't you remove them? And right. she said that that's what the actresses in Hollywood do. <laughs> the LA treatment. Yeah, yeah. And he was like, but you're not an actress. 
Yeah. Well, in her mind, she might have been. I mean, but. maybe, but yeah. I mean, she's embarrassed about it now. But I'm like, it's cool. People love it. You know, you're yeah. so LA, Grandma. Yeah. You know? Right. You know. It's something about LA. So LA kind of transformed her, and it, <laughs> yeah. and it transformed Mom. She came out there. And That's what happens. You go to LA and you start wearing sunglasses in yeah. places that you shouldn't. Yeah. You do. I guess so. I guess so. So. I mean, we see, you know, all these, you know, really, in essence, these good things that are happening. I mean, you're growing, you're seeing different generations coming into this and supporting you. And so there's a little bit of, okay, um, there's a little bit of the pushback from Tom's family. But essentially, everything else is, is really going just, just phenomenal. You know, that's well, I mean, what it sounds like, or at least really well. Yeah, because I mean, even Tom's mom, I mean, she eventually kind of came around and she would come and visit us. Um, I mean, the first trip that she came was, I was really scared. I'm yeah. like, is this her way of coming? Is she going to like kill me when I'm sleeping or something? Right. Um, I know that's not funny, but um, I just, you know, I didn't know. Um, and I mean, she never apologized for what happened when he came out. It's just something that she just didn't talk about, but we're like, okay, if she's willing to come visit us, you know, that's probably her way of accepting us. And, sure. Um, so even with her, things got a lot better. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, I even sent her like Mother's Day flowers and- Oh, nice. Yeah, stuff like that, so. Huh. So you've done all this work, all this process, because relationships are work. That's, that's for certain. Uh, Dustin Hoffman said, that uh, you know, being in a relationship, that's a lot to ask of two people. You know, he, he mentioned that, and I have to agree. So you do all of this work, and then there's a particular day that, that comes. And um, I know it, was, it turns out to be a very tough uh, day a, a, as an understatement. So there's the reality of um, what you heard in terms of something had happened with, with Tom. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that in terms of? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, when you're, when you're in your 20s, you just kind of feel like fearless and you feel like you have like a lifetime ahead of you. Right. Um, and so, yeah, you just, you never have conversations as to like, well, what would happen if there was ever like, an accident or something, and, mm -hmm. um, and again, kind of like going back to the the whole marriage thing, that you know you're not thinking of the legal protections that that provides um, right. until you you know run into a situation where um, I mean you just wish that you had the same yeah. rights when that other people had. Yeah. yeah. So I know that was harrowing, and and we have um, some footage on that that kind of really takes us through the arc. It takes us through, you know, the whole reckoning that you had. So let's, um, let's look at that. The thing that haunts me now is we had a fight that morning. Originally, we were supposed to hang out with our friend Alex and go take photographs together. And after our little argument, I decided that I would just stay home. Tom and I decided to meet at the studio and we kept going back and forth. And he's like, let's go to your place. I, I just remember the sunlight in the kitchen. I, I need some of that sunlight now. And I was like, okay. He was like, no, I want to do something good for you. Let's do a photo shoot. It turned this day around. So I had just started dating this man and it was his birthday and it, we, I wasn't with him. So Tom was like, I want to make him jealous. So let's put pictures of you on Facebook. And he was the one that was like, let's do it, let's do it. Hey, can I do your hair? He's like, um, okay. Yeah. And I have, you know, my brazier filled with socks because, you know, there's just not much there. So Tom and I were texting throughout the day, and we eventually made up. It wasn't even a discussion whether or not to go to the roof because we always went to the roof. And we told each other that we love each other, and I'm so thankful that we did because I have that forever now. And so by the time we get up to the roof, um, Tom has his camera, he's all ready. We'd all been up there like 50 times, and every time I'm just paranoid, because it's not like a, a tall wall, it's a short wall. He just playing around with the camera. And meanwhile, I know that he had just been texting with Shane. I told him to stay away from the edge, because we all know that he's a klutz. And he even wrote back, he was like, ha ha, I will. Like, I was joking, and 
I, I said, Tom, I'm serious. Like, stay away from the edge. So he, um, he takes a bunch of pictures. I'm trying to be as slutty and as, you know, not sexy because it wasn't sexy. Um, I'm in one corner, and then we suddenly switch. And um, he's like, oh, I've got it, I've got it. So he takes, like, three or four steps back. I don't think we registered that he was going to fall. He was like, oh, and I was like, oh, you know, and I, and I looked at him, and it was like we both thought, oh, no, Shane's going to be so mad. <laughs> you know, just like, you know, if he knew that we were that close. And then after that, it was a nightmare. I, um, I didn't even go look over the edge, so I just, like, tore my shoes off, ran downstairs. I had my phone in my back pocket, and I dialed 911, but I couldn't hear. So I just give it to somebody out in the hallway because people heard him. I received a text from Alex to tell me that Tom had fallen. And I, I thought it was a joke. There's no way this is real. So I texted her back and I said, that's not funny. And then I didn't hear back from her. And so then I called Tom's phone and no one picked up. So at that moment is when like my heart just started racing. And by the time I get there, he's on you know, his stomach, and I'm rubbing his back. I'm saying, it's okay, Tommy, it's okay, Tommy. Meanwhile, I look like a total hooker. <laughs> um, but it takes forever for the ambulance to get there. I wanna say 25 minutes later, they were like, do you have his ID? Do you have his ID? I was like, what the fuck does it matter? Just get him on the ambulance. So I got to the ER and they took me into a room where Alex was and she was hysterical. When I first saw Shane, I said, I wish you were me. <sighs> I said, because you two have each other and the love you have is so strong, I wish it had been me, fellow. I asked her, you know, well, what's happening? Are they working on him? I, I didn't know anything. She didn't know anything. We hugged, you know, and we said we loved each other. And, um, you know, we were still hanging on to hope that he was okay. I tried calling Shane and I couldn't get through to him. And um, finally he calls me back. He said, Mom, Tom was doing a photo shoot and he fell off the roof. And I just, oh my God. I said, honey, just keep on praying. He'll be fine. You know, we'll get the prayers going here. I got a text message from Shane saying, Michaela, please pray. Tom's hurt. And I immediately got down and started praying. So a little bit later, he calls me and, and he says, Mom, they, they won't let me in to see him. And I said, well, how come? And they said, because I'm not family. And I just, oh my God, Shane. So I called Tom's mom and it's, you know, late at night in Indiana. And, uh, you know, the first thing she says was, well, how much was he drinking, Shane? And um, and then his dad in the background was said, well, what the hell was he doing on the roof? And I just, but from that point forward, I made sure to let the nursing staff or the doctors speak to her and to him. And it had been probably about an hour later, the, the doctor came into the room and like, I just, I knew. Like I knew what he was gonna say and when he when he was talking like it just it wasn't registering in my head like i wasn't processing what he said he just said he didn't make it i mean it was very you know and um we all just lost it well i had to just leave the room because i couldn't hear it alex was crying and she was continually doing this i think she was just so traumatized and alex's mom was saying oh my god Oh, my God. And sometimes she would say, oh, his mother. Like, because Mother's Day was the next day. So I went outside. I called my mom, and... And I was like, Mom, like, he died. And, you know, she just said, like, I'm so sorry, Shane. Like, I'm so sorry. And he's just crying, and I'm crying. And, you know, here you are again. 1,500 miles away, and you can't be there for your child. And I got a hold of him, and Tom had just died on the, uh, in the hospital. And 
I don't know, it's not a moment I want to ever go through again. The worst pain I have ever felt in my heart. Like, it just, I, I just sunk. I just said, are you, are you fucking kidding me? Seriously? I, I said, seriously, who dies like that? I figured Shane was probably there when he passed, by his bed, holding his hand, and he said no. So I went to the nurse's station and I said, you know, my friend's boyfriend is here. He just passed away. Can you take him back? And she said, we can't allow non-family members to see him until his parents arrive. So I kept trying to argue with this nurse. And the lady was like, I understand, honey, I do, but it's against the hospital rules. He's not his family. I said, but he is his family. They have a house together. They have a business together. They have a dog together. They've been together for six years. Finally, we were sitting in a room and this one nurse opened the door and she said, is Shane in here? And so we went outside. She was holding Tom's license and she said, man, he was a good looking guy. Jeez, I mean, all the nurses back here are talking about how handsome he was, and we've been working back here to try to kind of make him look the way that you remember him. Come with me, and we're gonna take you back. I think at the end of the day, the nurses knew, you know, it's not a gay thing, it's not a straight thing, it's a human thing, but it was definitely a, a gift, I think, that those women gave to Shane. So they walked me back to his room. There was tubes all over his body, tubes coming out of his chest. His face was covered, but you could see that there, you know, had been blood, like, all around his face. And it didn't really seem like this was happening. I just stood there for a while. I didn't know what to do. The only place that I could put my hand was like on his leg. Then I did, you know, one final tap, tap, tap. So you, your, your worst nightmare. And you're looking to go ahead and move forward and there's that journey thing we were talking about earlier so how do you do that yeah i mean there's just like there's so many things like i mean it was my worst nightmare and then then you have you know tom's family that you know, decide to like ban me from his funeral and to, like mm -hmm. just not give me any information. So it's like, it's like just one thing after another. So you're already like in that place of like shock, and then it's just like you know compounded by yeah. what their actions were. And um, but on one level, like even at the hospital, it's it was almost like I was like conditioned to feel like what they were doing was like that it's okay, almost. It's like mm -hmm. that I shouldn't speak up or do anything. Um, you know, it's just kind of like feeling like I was less than and that, yeah, that, that was fine what they're doing. But thankfully, my friend was there because I wouldn't have been able to, to see him otherwise. I mean, and legally, those nurses could have been fired. Sure. Um, and so I just say, yeah, I'm just, I'm so grateful that, that they did what they felt was right, you know? Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, for any of us, most of us have lost like someone that we love, and um, I mean, it, you can just feel, you know, like almost as if like life is like meaningless for a period of time, and um, and I think for me, so much of my identity was, you know, like through him, it was like Shane and Tom, Tom and Shane, like, mm -hmm. you know, I met him when I was like 19, and so it was like. You know, and being together for six years, like those are the years you start to really figure out who yeah. you are. And so it was like, sure. I was figuring out who I was like with him. So I'd be like, I became who I was like because of him in a way. And, um, and so I, yeah, I definitely felt like part of me was like just missing and I didn't know how I would like move forward. But you kind of just, just go with the motions and just do what you have to do. I mean, I had bills to pay, so you have to work. Right. Um, yeah, you just kind of just you know, 
one day at a time. You do it. Yeah. And I think most people, when you have something insurmountable that you have to negotiate and then you tell someone else what you've done, you've survived cancer, you, you've gone through bankruptcy, whatever it is. That, that you've gone through while also going to school, Cincinnati State, and raising kids and doing all these things. Um, and people say, you know, how do you do it? And you just do it. And it sounds like that's, that's what you're saying. I mean, you had your, your process, but ultimately right. you had to, you know, marshal, you know, your, your forces and, and, well, and I, move, move ahead. I mean, I, I projected this image that I was like just completely fine because I didn't want my family to worry and um, really? or my friends hmm. and, um, I mean, they knew that I was like sad, but I also sure. I just wanted them to think that I was okay. And so I wouldn't really open up and like show emotion. I, my entire life I'd struggled with like showing that yeah. side of me. It's really yeah. hard for me to open up to people. Did that obstruct your, what, the work that you did with, with coming out in any kind of way? Did you feel like you almost had to go back into a closet of sorts by projecting this, this Teflon image? Um, yeah, I, mean, I just feel like had I been like, had I felt like there was an environment that I could just talk openly, like growing up, right. that it would have made it easier just to be maybe more open with mm -hmm. who I am. And just, again, kind of going back to that safe space, that if you feel like you have someone that you can talk to. Um, and so, yeah, I just was never really that comfortable talking to anyone about, you know, like the deeper issues that, you know, you typically like keep to yourself. Yeah. Um, Which is interesting because that process is typically coded as being masculine. Right. Yeah. I mean, heaven know. forbid, like men show emotion. Right. <laughs> um, right. But yeah, I mean, like my dad. Because you're from Montana. Yeah, I'm from Montana. And like yeah. my, my dad, I can remember him crying like twice, I mm -hmm. think. Um, you can count it. <laughs> yeah, my entire life. Yeah. Yeah. And one time was when um, our dog passed away, mm. and it was just like kind of like a tragic passing for the dog. And other than that, um, yeah. So just you know, didn't see that very often around me. The men in my life showing emotion. Sure. So I think yeah. I mean, after he passed away, like I kept to myself, and I was very very depressed. Um, I even like started like drinking. Um, that. It wasn't really me. I wasn't a big drinker. Um, and as the, like the first anniversary was approaching, like there's something about like anniversaries that you know we put so much like importance on like anniversaries. Right. And, and so for me, it was about like a month before, um, which would be May seventh, two thousand twelve. I, I, for whatever reason, there was like something inside of me that I felt like. I had to like speak up for myself and like just you know stand up for myself and that with like the hospital and like with the way that his family treated me from like you know threatening me and to show up if I showed up at the funeral um, just all these things where I didn't really fight back I kind of just let it happen um, and also because I didn't want to like hurt his parents any more than they were already hurting because I know that they were I mean clearly hurting, like sure. losing a child, because I don't know what that's like, but um, yeah, I just decided that I wanted to tell my story and share my experience, um, which I never would really share much of myself in that way, so yeah. I decided to put together a short video um, as a way to hopefully educate others, but also honor Tom and our relationship. It was kind of like my moment to say, like, this is who I am, this was our relationship, like there's no reason for me to be ashamed of what we had. And um, it wasn't until after he passed away that at his memorial that we had in LA, that was the first time um, that I shared photos of us like kind of being more like affectionate. Mm -hmm. Like no one had ever seen that. Like our friends are like, whoa, they were affectionate. It was just something yeah. that we just weren't comfortable you know, doing that. Um, and so to put this video together and to like show those images and just to be so open with what I was feeling um, was terrifying, but it was also like very healing just putting that video together um, and not even knowing what would happen. I just, I'm like, I'm going to post this on the anniversary and hopefully yeah. it'll reach people. Just let it go. Um, 
I, mean, I, I just didn't anticipate that it would change my life. Um, like that. Um, one of the things you were talking about, you said that, you know, as one of your coping mechanisms, you know, after the accident is, you know, you started drinking and, and you know, I guess numbing the pain. Um, so I teach English here and we just had a quiz uh, recently and it's called Why Men Don't Last. And in there, it's a little bit anecdotal and there's some, you know, statistics in there. And um, it talks about drinking and, and doing those kinds of things. But in effect, it says, you know, like we know, I mean, most men just don't have the best outlets, the best coping mechanisms. And, you know, men are two to three times more likely to, to self-destruct as, as a reality of that. Did you ever feel like you were on a path of self-destruction? Oh, I mean, yeah, definitely. There was moments where I was just, I felt like I was just going to like lose it. Um, or I was just going to go crazy mm -hmm. almost. Um, and, and what kept you together? Cause you were keeping it together for everyone else. Yeah. I think just thinking of Tom, um, that helped a lot. Mm -hmm. Just knowing that he wouldn't want me to like go down that path of like self-destruction and that he would want me to just try to be happy. Right. And I know that, you know, I was trying to put myself in that position if I was him that I wouldn't, or yeah, that I wouldn't want him to be like suffering. Um, you know, had I passed, mm -hmm. I'd want him to just, you know, try to be happy, but easier said than done. <laughs> That's right. Especially when you're being threatened and, and you've already, um, talked about that a little bit and we have, um, a short clip on that when you had to deal with being threatened, you know, and during the aftermath. So let's, uh, let's look at that. So although I never heard from Martha, my mom and Alex and I, we all booked our plane tickets. During a layover, I received a phone call from one of Tom's relatives and she wanted to let me know that I wasn't welcome to attend his funeral because if I do show up, his uncle and his father had planned an attack. And she wanted me to know that it's for my own safety that I don't go. All I could think of is, are they going to shoot him? Are they going to kill my son? When we got into Indiana, one of Tom's best friends picked us up, and Alex was hysterical. And the closer we got to Knox, the, the more hysterical she got. And she was saying, I lost Tom. I don't want to lose you also. I was terrified that they were going to come and put out a gun on Shane. And I remember him saying more than once, you know, they're in a lot of pain. It's not just me that's going through this and almost arguing for them, which was maddening. I mean, I'd be angry. You're not going to do this to me. Nope, he didn't respond that way. We had a secret relocation to kind of come up with a plan about, you know, just kind of staying out of their way. And even though I couldn't be in the church, like I wanted to be as close as I could to Tom, just being near was somehow comforting. Once I realized that Shane had been banned from attending the funeral, I realized that's why they weren't telling anybody when things were. They basically were keeping all the information close hold so that Shane couldn't get there. In the blink of an eye, everything's changed. There were probably 800 people there. Half of them were there to support Tom, and the other half were there to support Martha. If I could have one more day, I'd spend it all with you. Casket was in the middle, and it was draped with a Culver blanket and all of his Culver accomplishments, and, and his mom was wearing his Culver ring. But I think it was very reflective of the family and how they viewed Tom, and not the Tom that I knew. When I got up to Martha, all I could think in my head was, I have to kiss the casket for Shane. And I made my way over to the casket, and I kissed it, and I whispered, you know, Shane loves you. The funeral depicted Tom up until the point where he left for California, basically. The speakers were all from Tom's childhood. You know, it was his piano teacher and people from Culver. I took the flowers from the bouquet that the class of 2000 sent, and I dried them so I could give those to Shane. And I saved him a program because, you know, he's the love of Tom's life. He at least deserves that. 
Unfortunately, he wasn't mentioned in it. Families for literally 30 years can sweep that secret under the rug until someone dies, and then you have to really face the music. And I think that's what happened to Tom's parents. They had this great child. He was smart and talented, lots of positive things. But the one positive thing that they, they didn't want to brag to their friends about is that Tom had an amazing partner because they were ashamed. And so what they did is they literally erased it from the history books by shutting down his Facebook page, by disinviting Shane to the funeral. They're not even mentioning him there, which is the most insulting thing anyone could ever do to a person's memory. They're not fighting against gay marriage. They're not fighting against having a gay son. What they're fighting against is love. And who fights against love? Yeah, who fights against that? So uh, the movie Stonewall is out right now, and it's not getting the, the best reviews. But, um, but for those who don't know, you know, Stonewall was kind of this, um, this, this tipping point where it's like, you know what, enough is enough. Enough injustice, enough, yeah, just injustice and, and being beat down, and I'm, I'm going to move forward. Um, did you ever feel like, and I guess I'm sure you did, at some point, what happened is you had kind of your own stonewall mm -hmm. moment by this treatment right. that you were dealing with? Yeah, like, that's kind of like what I was saying about like a month or two before the anniversary. Um, I wouldn't necessarily, necessarily say that there was a day where it just like shifted. It was kind of more just gradual. a gradual thing. Yeah. Um, uh, but I think for me, that that moment was ultimately when I just uploaded the YouTube video um, and made it live. And even like not knowing what was going to happen to the video, just the, the process of posting it and making it live, mm -hmm. that alone just felt so good to put it out there. Yeah. To like share myself in that way. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so now you feel like you don't have to be like afraid anymore. Well, or? I mean, one thing, cause when I posted this YouTube video, and I don't know if you guys, if any of you have seen it, but um, I mean, within like seven days, it had over two million views and there was messages from people all over the world. Mm -hmm. And one thing that I quickly realized was that what I was going through was not that unique that there were, I heard from thousands of people who had been through similar experiences and um, people who had been in a relationship for like 20 years and their partner passed away and to this day they don't even know where their partner's body is. Right. Um, so it's just, it was very eye-opening to share my experience and to hear other people's experiences um, because, I mean, I knew that what happened to me had happened before but I didn't realize just like how many people have yeah. gone through something like that. Um, and what it did is it just motivated me even more to, to keep sharing my story. Because um, what happened is after I posted that, about three weeks later is when I received a phone call um, from a director, uh, Linda Bloodworth Thomason, mm -hmm. and she created a TV show called Designing Women. I don't know if anyone knows that show. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, sometimes people are like, well, I don't know. Um, that's an 80s classic. Right, yeah. yeah. That's some good stuff. Um, <laughs> Meshach Taylor and all them. And, and so, yeah, so she called me and she said that she saw my YouTube video and that she wanted to meet with me. And so I met with her. I went to like the CBS movie lot and um, yeah, I went into her office and the first thing she did is she shared a story with me about her mom um, who uh, was a victim of transfused AIDS. Mm -hmm. So this was during the AIDS crisis. So she was in the hospital with her mom um, you know, while all of these gay men were just dying around her and the nurses were like, you know, so afraid of what was going on that um, they would put pills in a bucket and literally kick the bucket into her mom's room. And there was one day that she was visiting her mom and she overheard nurses in the hallway talking and uh, one of the nurses said that this disease was killing all the right people. And um, when she shared that story, I mean, it, it broke my heart. Sure. Um, but she just talked about how that inspired her to um, become an ally and to mm -hmm. you know, fight for equality. And I mean, I feel like that could have easily gone the opposite way, that she could have resented the LGBT community. Right, right. Um, 
But, depends on how you look at it, yeah. Yeah, but she used it to as an opportunity to educate people. And I, um, Designing Women, she even had an episode that talked about AIDS, like, and that was at a time where TV shows did not really discuss that. Sure, yeah. Um, so anyway, so she said that she wanted to tell my story and that she wanted to make a documentary. And um, given the response from the YouTube video and just being with her and talking to her, I just felt like it was the right thing to do. Um, and so then we uh, launched a Kickstarter campaign mm -hmm. and we raised um, like almost $400,000 in 30 days. Um, it became the most funded film project in the history of Kickstarter That's at awesome. that time. Yeah. Um, which was just insane because it was like the YouTube's but we went viral and then yeah. making a documentary and now this Kickstarter campaign and um, and I think for me just going through that process of making the film uh -huh. and you know she wanted me to be there so going through that footage and helping like put the story together was also very therapeutic for me sure. yeah. um, and the the interviews with her was kind of like one of the first moments that I really opened up and talked about stuff that you know I hadn't really talked about before. So um, yeah, that was a very healing process. Yeah, so I see this like almost coming full circle where, you know, you have your issue with being, you know, more closed up and then there's this transformative relationship and then you open up and then there are circumstances that happen with the accident and then it kind of has you closing up again and dealing with issues. And then all of a sudden you get the support once again, you know, in a similar way you got it from you know, from the snake killer, <laughs> from grandma and others, you go on and you um, get this encouragement and you stand up for yourself. It, it looks like it looks like you're empowered with that. And we have one final clip that's showing you being triumphant and, and succeeding. So here's our last clip showing that. It's the same hate that's caused wars from religion. Gender, the skin color, the complexion of your pigment, the same fight that led people to walkouts and sit-ins. It's human rights for everybody. There is no difference. Live on and be yourself. When I was at church, they taught me something else. If you preach hate at the service, those words aren't anointed. That holy water that you soak in has been poisoned. When everyone else is more comfortable remaining voiceless rather than fighting for humans that have had their rights stolen. I might not be the same, but that's not important. No freedom till we're equal. Damn right I support it. Silence the cars We're cutting like knives in a fist fight And I found you with the bottle of wine You had in the curtains And heart like the 4th of July You swore and said we are not We are not shining stars This I know I never said we are Though I've never been through hell like that I've closed enough windows to so know you can never look back If you're lost in a zone Or you're sinking like a stone Carry on May your past be the sound Of your feet upon the ground Carry on Carry on An article came out in the paper and then we had it on our, our news channels and it was hard for several of my family members to see uh, my son on there with his gay partner. Uh, it didn't bother me but it bothered a lot of people. I ignore it because I'm proud of what Shane's doing and because I'll always be grateful for Tom and what he gave to my son. Many times he said, you know, my life is not worth living without Tom. He's risen like a phoenix from the ashes. Shane is the guy who was afraid of coming out and accepting who I was, and now he's in front of the parade with rainbow flags behind him. I made something positive out of it, which is always Tom's motto. Shane gave discrimination against gays a beautiful 
unforgettable face, and that face was Tom. Okay, so that's definitely standing up for yourself, and, and then, it, like you were saying, it becomes much more than just just you. It, it's a it's a it's a universal language. It's actually interesting because it kind of goes back to the Oprah's life you want to her. Uh huh. Because um, she made a comment about how when you lose yourself in something that's bigger than you, then extraordinary things can happen. Yeah. And so I feel like with me and the YouTube video and just sharing my story, I do feel like. Um, although it's my story, I feel like it's 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 bigger than me, and that, sure. um, the fact that it isn't that unique in many ways, that it represents so many people. Um, it, yeah, it's, to me, that kind of one of the most beautiful things about it is that it does represent a lot of people, and yeah. And did the Taj Mahal help you with that? Because I know that that's talked about in the documentary because it's it's built uh, as an expression of love, right. basically. Well, I mean, up until Tom, I'd never really traveled places. And so, mm -hmm. um, you know, went to Paris and like um, Egypt and you know, just amazing places. But uh, yeah. the Taj Mahal, I went there after he passed away, um, which was, I mean, it was kind of just terrifying because, you know, this was a place that we wanted to go together and I just mm -hmm. didn't know how I would feel. And the first night that I got there, I, I was just like, I don't know if I can do this. Like, you know, I'm here without him. It just did not feel right. Yeah. But then I'm like, you know what? I'm here. Like, try to just enjoy it, and I did. And um, that was a big step for me to just take that trip. Um, yeah, it helped me a lot. That's good. And so that, yeah, that was just like a few months before I put the YouTube video together. Mm. Another thing too gotcha. that it's interesting because the documentary is called Bridegroom and. Uh, when I met with Linda, when she told that story to me about her mom, she also, she said, Shane, um, his, his last name is Bridegroom. And I was like, yeah. I'm like, I know, it's kind of a weird last name. Right. Um, she's like, no, but don't you see that what's happening is much bigger than Tom and it's much bigger than you? Mm -hmm. And that was like the first moment that I actually really thought about that. I'm like, whoa, that is weird that his last name is bridegroom yeah um and that this message kind of became about you know marriage equality and so i mean you can't help but think um, you know that maybe this is part of some bigger plan i don't know sure um, yeah there's that symbol and substance yeah. once again from from president clinton some some people think we you know just made up the name and like um yeah there's a shot that's in the film where i go to visit his um grave site which we filmed for the, the documentary, which that was scary, going to his hometown sure. and like not knowing if his, anyone from his family was gonna be there. Right. Um, and it was just me and one camera guy and like I heard like a chick chick. So I was like, oh gosh. Um, but it was a cameraman. He's like, oh, I'm okay. not fucking around. Sorry, I just right. swore. Um, <laughs> oh, you're allowed yeah, to. <laughs> his name is Zorba. Um, and I know. Um, and then we were just standing there and like this car pulled up and just parked there. Mm. Um, like really um, tinted windows, you couldn't see in, and then like a few minutes later, it just sped away. Okay. So we're like, okay, I think we're done here now. Yeah. Um, yeah. But anyway, so at the gravesite, that's when I discovered with him that day um, that I mean, they had this like huge like monument that they made for him, and mm -hmm. um, on each side of you know Tom's uh, gravestone, there was one for his mom and one for his dad. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. Um, which I'd never really seen that before. Um, I mean, to me, it kind of made sense maybe if like he was the only child or something, mm -hmm. but he has a brother and a sister. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're, they're half brother and sister, yeah. but and still. And you have two siblings yourself. Yeah. yeah. So I just kind of felt like this was their final moment to like really just like block me from ever right. like being next to him and yeah. you know, just uh, something that they could control. Absolutely. So that was, yeah, it was upsetting. Anyway, so yeah, people thought that we put like bridegroom like on the gravestone. I'm like, that would be a little tacky, I think, yeah, to put a film be. title on the gravestone. But It would be, yeah. Um, yeah so and, and, and in the documentary, you said that Tom is the monument to you. And you were referring to his, his family, I would guess. Yeah, well, I mean, even just like after he passed away with the funeral, I feel like you know, you should do what you think that the person who passed away would want. And so that was what was upsetting to me. I'm yeah. like, this is not what he would want. Like, right. 
that that's what really hurt. I'm like, well, how can you do this to him? Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, it's, here they are, like, spending who knows how much money to make this, like, you know, monument um, to kind of show, like, how much they love their son. And um, to me, I'm just like, this This doesn't represent, like, your relationship or, like, who you were to him or, or who he yeah. was to you. Um, it's just who Tom was as a person was really, like, the monument to them and to, like, us. And so, exactly. Yeah. And I think this is apropos since it's October 1st and this is LGBTQ History Month, so this is a nice way to kind of commemorate that. And we also have to thank Andrew Milani and Mary Beth Barnes as well, because they really worked hard also to make this happen. And Mary Beth is over there. Oh, yes. Want to do that? Thank you. And Love you, Mary Beth. <laughs> yeah. And Brandon actually first met him and pitched this idea to me. So we want to give you a round of applause for that. Yeah, we met in, in Dayton. Yeah. It was like in May or something. May for Gay Pride. Yeah. And then who would have thought that here I am. Here you are. Yeah. October 1st. So we thank you for coming. Thank you. And, uh, you know, you check out Bridegroom. And we have an In the Zone meeting. Um, October 7th, it's in this building, 102, and we'll probably talk more about this um, and other things as well. Thank you so much for your time. I'll, I'll be hanging out if, like, anyone, if you want to say hi or ask something. That, yeah, yeah I'll be talk to him. Talk yeah. to Shane. So thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks.